exercising. Uh, it's good to kind of go back over things. Uh, they say that unless a human being hears something 16 times, <laughs> we don't retain it. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I probably need it more than 16 times. I'm getting old. But it's good to recap. So we remember what we've talked about. Creation, good. The fall of angels and men, not good. Pride, disobedience, death. The incarnation, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. God assumes a human nature. Why? To take it to the cross, redemption. The passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. What's our part in all of it? Well, we have a part in every bit of it. We have a part in creation. We certainly experience the fall, sin. We have the experience of the incarnation, God drawing close to us. And we participate in the fruits of redemption. Each one of us in our own life, in our own place, in our own way, should make Christ present. After all, we are Christians. We are those who bear Christ within us. And so in this immortal combat, this spiritual warfare, we have to enter into the fray armed with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have cautioned you along the way uh, not to get carried away too far one way or the other, to be well balanced. It's very important to be well balanced. Now, please don't go home and tell your pastor that Father Karafi says the devil is under every rock. And, and don't be worried. You know, the, yes, these things are real. But as I've told you, as a Christian and as a Catholic, as long as you stay out of serious sin, as long as you live your Christian faith, all right, maybe you can't live it perfectly, but as best you can, you're going to be all right. The devil's like a vicious dog on a short chain. Don't get in range, okay? It wouldn't be wise to get too close to a 200-pound Rottweiler who isn't feeling well this morning, or maybe he's a little hungry. And we just wouldn't be smart to do that. That's mortal sin. That's what it means to get in range of the devil. That's the only way the devil can hurt you, is through sin. So don't give in to that. Don't give him permission to have power over in your life. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, as sacred scripture says. Let me read to you from a... Oh, it's a, one of the appendix in uh, Father Gabriel Amorth's book, An Exorcist Tells a Story, published by Ignatius Press. Uh, St. Teresa is speaking to all of us. She's a doctor of the church. There are only 33 doctors of the church. In, in 2,000 years of Christianity, we only have 33. Out of all the thousands of saints that there are, there are only 33 doctors. Uh, one of them is St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus. Listen to what she has to say. If this Lord is powerful, as I see that he is, and I know that he is, and if the devils are his slaves, and there's no doubt about that because it's a matter of faith, what evil can they do to me since I am a servant of this Lord and King? Why shouldn't I have the fortitude to engage in combat with all of hell? I took a cross in my hand, and it seemed to me truly that God gave me courage because in a short while I saw that I was another person, and I wouldn't feel bodily com combat with all of them, for I thought that with that cross I would easily conquer them all. And so I said, come on now, all of you, for being a servant of the Lord, I want to see what you can do to me. There was no doubt in my opinion that they were afraid of me for I remain so calm and so unafraid of all of them. All the fears that I usually felt left me, even to this very day, for although I sometimes saw them, as I shall relate later, I no longer had hardly any fear of them. Rather, it seemed that they were afraid of me. I was left with a mastery over them truly given by the Lord of all. I, may, I pay no more attention to them than to flies. I think they're such cowards that when they observe that they are esteemed but little, their strength leaves them. These enemies don't know how to attack head on, save those whom they see surrender to them. Or when God permits them to do so, 
for the greater good of his ser servants whom they tempt and torment. May it please his majesty the Lord that we fear him who we ought to fear and understand that more harm can come to us from one venial sin than from all hell put together. For this is so. Now that's a doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila. And that's what she has to say about it. Remember I told you one night the devil appeared to her in a horrible form hovering over her bed. She woke up out of a dead sleep and saw him standing there like a monster. And she said, oh, it's only you. And she turned over and went back to sleep. <laughs> That's a good example, you know. So listen, all this talk about spiritual combat and all this talk about the reality of the battle between heaven and hell, between the demons and the good angels, <clears throat> it is true, but don't let it worry you. You know, don't go home and lose sleep tonight, all right? So listen, you're the children of God, and your Father loves you, and he has given to you at your disposal great and powerful weapons. Make sure that you use them, and don't give away your freedom to the enemy. All right, this last talk, is going to be on the power of the cross of Christ in this spiritual combat. Now, for ages and ages since the original sin, the devil held a certain mastery over humanity because of sin. That's the only way he can enslave us is through sin. And we, ha we do that ourselves. We have a free will. We don't have to sin, but we choose to. And that's how we give away our freedom. That's how the devil gains mastery over soul. That's how indeed we can lose our eternal salvation. How did Jesus overturn the reign of sin, Satan, and death? By the power of his cross. He took his human nature, which he had united to his divine nature, the two natures subsisting in the person of the eternal word, he brought that nature to the cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day. Why? For us. We were in need of a savior. And so he took upon himself our sins, and he nailed them to the cross, and he led off the devils as captives. He took the sting out of death, as the fathers of the church have said and as we say in our prayers. We enter into the life and mission of Jesus Christ. The day that you and I were baptized, we were brought into the mystery of the life and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a baptized person. The servant is no better than his master. The master said, where I am, there my servant will be. Where is he? Lifted up on a cross. He said, it is necessary that I be lifted up in order to draw all men to myself. The cross. The cross is the crossroads where all roads cross. From my reconversion to the faith, I had an intuitive understanding that this mystery of redemptive suffering was something very important for every human being. If the church doesn't have an answer to the big question, why, why suffering? Why me, Lord? Why did my husband die young of cancer? Why is my son in jail? Why is my daughter an alcoholic? Why, why, why? That question reverberates down through the ages. The pained question that echoes in every human heart in one way or another. Why does a good God permit so much evil? Once Dr. Billy Graham who was a great Christian evangelist. I respect him very much. 
he was on television being interviewed by David Frost. And David Frost said, Dr. Graham, how is it that a God who is love, a God who is so good, how can such a good God allow so much evil? And Dr. Graham, being an honest man, said what intelligent, educated people often have to say. I don't know, David. I don't know. Now, Protestant theology does not provide an answer to that. There's a difference here. Now, actually, he, Dr. Graham responded correctly. He says, I don't know. That is a mystery. And he's right. It is a mystery. The mystery of why God permits evil. In other words, why do bad things happen to good people? Why me? I've always been a good Catholic. I go to church all the time. I don't live in mortal sin. Why do bad things happen to me? Inevitably, everyone who draws closer to the Lord is ultimately given a greater share in his cross. You ever, you ever notice that? Like, maybe you had a kind of um, reconversion in your faith or you got more serious about it when you hit a certain age. It often happens that uh, adults, uh, when they get about in their 30s or around 30 or late 20s, they get married. It's, it coincides with that time when the brain starts functioning rather than hormones. It kind of co coincides with that period of time when your brain actually starts to govern what you do rather than hormones. That often governs what people do until they get well into their 20s or even 30s, and some of them never learn. But then we begin to get serious about our faith, maybe, start, maybe even go to daily mass, say the rosary, and inevitably those people encounter violent opposition from the enemy. I can't, I can't tell you how many people have come to me, but Father, I've gotten serious about my faith. I now go to Mass every day. Why, I pray the rosary. I wear a brown scapular. I believe everything the Church teaches, and everything has started to go wrong. My family thinks I'm a nut. They think I'm a religious fanatic. That's a very, very common complaint of people who become serious about their faith. Well, why do these things happen? Well, it's logical. When you're living in sin, you're no threat to the devil's kingdom. You get out of sin and you start living in grace, you're an enemy. You start doing some damage, and so you encounter opposition. The cross cannot be avoided. There are many, many, many people who would like to be with Jesus in the power and glory of his resurrection, but there are very few who are willing to stand there in the shame and darkness and pain of the cross. Jesus has many friends in his resurrection, but darn few in his crucifixion. I've got a real revelation for you. On my liturgical calendar, Good Friday always comes before Easter Sunday. How's that, rocket scientists? Hmm? You, you, can, you figure that out? I mean, you know that? You, sure, yeah, you know. Uh, please read my lips. Good Friday comes before Easter Sunday. You got it? You know what it means. It means no pain, no gain. Athletes know that. No pain, no gain. Oh, you don't want to work out? You don't want to work till it hurts? No pain, no gain. You get knocked flat on your butt. And in this spiritual combat, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory. And so, as Christians, we have a share in the cross of Christ. Padre Pio used to say, Jesus gives 
the biggest share of his cross to his best friend. And some of you, his best friends, might quickly think, I wish he wouldn't be so chummy with me. <laughs> St. Teresa of Avila, who I just quoted in that passage, one day was going through the countryside in Spain. She was driving in a horse and wagon in a carriage, and she was very sick. Uh, most of the saints had a great deal of suffering in their lives, physical, emotional, spiritual, and St. Teresa was not unlike all the great saints. She had all kinds of aches and pains and illnesses, and, and she was very sick with a terrible migraine headache, and she was going, bouncing through the countryside. It was rainy, it was cold and damp, a miserable day, and I've been in that part of Spain, and it is a, it can be cold and just awful weather. Well, it was one such day. The wagon wheel hit a rut and dumped the carriage over, and it just put her right into a ditch full of mud. She was cold, sick, covered with mud all over her nice Carmelite religious habit. And she looked up, and she said, Oh, Lord, if you treat your friends thus, no wonder you have so few of them. You see, even the saints, you know, had their patience tested. You know, they, they weren't infinite in their ability to carry the cross. You know, they, they had limitations. So uh, don't be too upset that you have limitations and that I have limitations. Uh, approach it with humility, and a sense of humor goes a long way. You know, I, I found out that a lot of the saints had a great sense of humor. A sense of humor in the face of suffering really is a powerful ally in your struggle. Padre Pio suffered for 50 years with the stigmata. He had tremendous pain from the wounds of Christ, which he had in his hands and his feet and his side. 50 years. One day, they had a big party for him on the 50th anniversary of his stigmata, and a man came up to him and said, Oh, God bless you, Padre Pio. May he grant you 50 more. And Padre Pio looked at him in horror and said, What did I ever do to you? <laughs> One day, a rather fancy rich lady came to the monastery. She was dressed up in very fine clothes, and. Padre Pio was used to the country people. He'd come from a, a family of poor farmers, and he was used to the women coming to church in their old black dresses and their shawls, very poor people. But this lady was a wealthy lady, maybe nobility, and she was dressed in her finery, and she situated herself in the corridor between the, the friary and the monastery church, and she waylaid Padre Pio as he came through. And she grabbed him by the sleeve of his habit and said, Now, Padre Pio, today is my birthday. Today is my 70th birthday. Now say something nice to me. And he smiled at her sweetly, and he leaned over and whispered in her ear, Death is near. <laughs> and he walked off. <laughs> yeah. It is reported that another lady who was large. She could have played defensive tackle for the Green Bay Packers. Very large. Approached him and said, Now, Padre Pio, what is it going to take to make me holy? And he looked her up and down, and he said, About 16 lengths. <laughs> and then he walked off. <laughs> but he was nice to her, though. He smiled when he said it. You say, oh, that's cruel. Well, you, you had to be there. <laughs> but many of the saints, they were not sourpusses. They were not dour, miserable human beings. They, they were people that could laugh. Uh, I have known some extremely holy people. I've known a couple people who will probably be canonized saints in due time. 
I, I, I mean, I don't know them well, but I, I met Mother Teresa, talked with her. She was at my ordination. Uh, the Holy Father, John Paul II, the founder of my own religious congregation, Father Jim Flanagan. I met some, they might not be canonized, oh, I think Mother Teresa and the Holy Father will be for sure, uh, but I've known many good holy people. Every single one of them seemed to have a pretty good sense of humor. They all experienced a lot of pain in their life, and they found that that sense of humor helped them help them to get through it. The devil hates you to be happy. He hates it. He doesn't want you to have any peace or joy. I, I think that some comedians like Bob Hope, and as long as the humor is wholesome, you know, and, and nothing impure, or anything, but I think they help humanity. You know, they say that laughing even helps cancer. People recover sometimes from cancer when they have regular humor. They've done research on it, and they've actually had periods of time where they were given a half hour a day of, of, of things to make them laugh, you know, comedy shows or whatever, and they found that it contributed significantly to their healing. When I was in that very, very dark period in my life, when I had lost everything in the world. Um, there is a pedagogical and purifying principle at work in human suffering. I had gone from a poor boy to a very wealthy man. I had achieved the American dream. I went on dates with movie stars. I went to parties with rock stars. I drove a Ferrari through Beverly Hills, lived in a million dollar mansion on the beach, had a yacht, on and on and on. And then I lost it all through my own stupidity. I almost died. I lost everything. I became so desolate. For three years, I was absolutely desolate. I had nothing. I lost everything. I was homeless in the streets of Los Angeles after having been a multimillionaire. Now, it's one thing to grow up poor and to stay poor all your life. You can be happy without having very much, but it's another thing to grow up poor, become very wealthy, and then to become absolutely destitute and be homeless in the street with the clothes on your back, no place to live, nothing to eat, not a nickel in your pocket, not a friend in the world. Darkness and desolation become your daily companion. I've been there and done that. Three years of pain, terrible pain. I remember one day stopping in the streets in Los Angeles. It was so horrible. And I stopped and said to myself out loud, what is this? What is this? The pain, emotional pain, was so intense why I could scarcely stand it. The threat the specter of suicide hung over me for years. I never attempted it. Uh, I grew up in the old church when they said, if you kill yourself, you go to hell. <clears throat> and somehow I believed it. So I wasn't willing to go that far, no matter how miserable I was. So I never attempted it. But I was terribly depressed, terribly anxious, in pain, in very great pain. I remember coming home to my mother's house, and it went from bad to worse, even though that was a good place, but the devil knew his grip was loosening on me. And he redoubled his efforts to do me in. I remember one night, I was in terrible emotional pain. I, I went to bed, and I slept, and I, now I don't put great stock in dreams and so forth. Most dreams are just the product of our own human imagination. They're perfectly natural and normal. But every once in a while, it is possible for God or the devil to speak through dreams, to influence us through dreams. Most of them, the vast majority of dreams, they come from our own psyche. They're natural. That's just totally normal. Once in a while, though, from God, from the devil, it can and does happen. 
Well, in the, in the depths of my darkness, my pain, <clears throat> I had a hilarious dream. It was, stu it was silly. I can't even recount it because it, it wouldn't sound funny. But this, this picture, this spectacle, and I, la I woke myself up. I laughed so hard that I woke myself up and my stomach hurt from laughing so hard. And I felt so good all day as a result of some of these things you discern by their effects. I have no doubt that some angel, maybe my guardian angel, had somehow transmitted this hilarious dream to me, which came in, in, in the, I saw some outlandish character in a duck marsh with some wild duck decoy, decoying ducks down. The ducks came down, took a look at that, and started laughing out loud. And I saw this ridiculous cartoon kind of dream, and I howled, with, and something changed inside of me. Uh, the darkness was dispersed for a while. That didn't come from the devil. I don't even think it came from me. I don't know where I could have conjured up something as wild as that. I think I had a little help. Another time when I was in Europe studying, I was about to be ordained a priest. I was within 60 days of ordination. It was all set. All our paperwork had gone in. I was approved. The Pope was going to ordain me a priest. Wow. Then one Friday, I came down terrible pain, and I had to go to the hospital, and I needed emergency surgery. And I went into this, the university I went to had a major medical teaching facility. And so the, a doctor, a surgeon, came out with five interns and 12 student nurses to watch the surgery. It was painful and it was humiliating. Well, they anesthetized me with a local anesthetic, and it didn't take. And they began to cut. And the pain was so horrible. I couldn't speak. I couldn't tell the doctor. He, he's saying in Spanish. I, I didn't speak Spanish very well. But the doctor is going in a very calm voice like doctors do. Now, how's that? Is that? Oh, does that feel better now? And how's that? Do you have any pain? I, I was in shock. My mouth wouldn't move. Uh, you know, he could have been murdering me right on the spot. I wouldn't have said anything. In the first place, I couldn't have thought of it in Spanish. In the second place, my mouth wouldn't move. Well... It finished, and I was almost in shock. Actually, during the surgery, I was drifting in and out of shock. Later, I had to go back for a series of quasi-surgical procedures where they opened the wound so that it would heal properly. No anesthetic, no nothing. I was surprised they didn't give me a bullet to bite on. <laughs> I remember in the middle of the surgery, I, I, I imagined that I heard John Wayne's voice. Now, come on, buckaroo. <laughs> Be a man about it. You can take it. My friend and I, who were studying together in that foreign country, we laughed. I was in terrible pain for two weeks. We would laugh about it. We would make up jokes, and, and, and it relieved the pain. You know, it took my mind off it for a while, and... Time passed. I was worried I wouldn't be ordained because I wouldn't be able to go. I wouldn't be well in time. But everything turned out well. Oh, I was healed wonderfully. My grandmother, while I was on the operating table, my grandmother, 94 years old, rosary praying, daily communicant lady all her life, my grandmother was in her last suffering. She died. Uh, she suffered and she died as I was on the operating table. There's a, an affinity, there's a closeness, something going on. I don't know, it's not just a coincidence. My grandmother helped me get to the priesthood. That suffering helped me get to the priesthood. There is not only an instructive dimension in suffering united to the suffering of Christ, there's a purifying dimension to it. Purgatory is the final purification. The cross purifies us. It capacitates us to receive grace, not just for ourselves, 
but for other people as well. I told you how my father, after he came, he heard me preach, he went to confession to me, and he said in total sincerity, I wish I could have been a better father. I tell you, God the Father heard that prayer a million times over. My father, who was a very, he wasn't a big man, but he was a powerful man. He was a great athlete when he was young. Uh, he was a boxer, played baseball, basketball, a rough guy, one of the roughest guys I ever knew. Well, my dad, in a couple short years, went from 220 pounds, muscular, strong man. He's, he's still alive, barely, about 80 pounds. I saw him a couple weeks ago. He's been suffering ever since he said that to me. I wish I could have been a better father. What happened? It's like God opened a sanctuary and invited him into a very sacred place. It is the place where God meets man, where heaven reaches down to earth and earth up to heaven. It is a place where north, south, east, and west meet, the intersection of the beams of the cross. That is where power is to be found. And so my dad entered the sanctuary of the cross of Christ, and his entire life, everything, centered on the cross. From that moment on, almost 40 surgeries have come and gone since then. Three open heart surgeries, valve replacement, surgeries on his spine, surgeries on his hands, very painful, surgeries on his eyes. One after the other, he scarcely had a moment's rest from pain piles of medication, pills on, on the table. None of them relieved the pain. His entire life was spent in and out of the hospital. It still is. In between preaching a couple years ago in Lent, I was on an airplane between every mission, and I preach all of Lent every year. I never have a week off during Lent. I go every single week preaching. In between, I was flying to Los Angeles every week to see my dad. He hung on the edge of death. He's been in and out of that never-never land, that balance point between life and death, countless times. I saw him a couple weeks ago. He was in the little hospital bed that he has in a corner of his house. On the wall, the rosary I gave him, I was the Holy Father gave me that rosary the day he ordained me. I gave it to my dad. He has it on the wall. He prays with it. The picture of the Holy Father's hands on my head when he ordained me. A little picture of the Blessed Mother. That's his entire world. And in the middle of it all, a large crucifix to remind him of the meaning of life. To remind him of his identity as a Christian. We have heard the term identity crisis. Priests in recent times have had identity crises. Religious have had identity crises. They leave their vocation. The priests take off. Married people have identity crises. They say, oh, well, the ma it's, no lo it's no longer relevant for me. I can't relate to you anymore. And they get divorced. They leave. They have an identity crisis. People don't know where they came from. People don't know where they're headed. People don't know where they are. That's a good definition of being lost. An identity crisis. We don't know the meaning of life. Where am I? Who am I? I have one piece of advice for anybody and everybody who ever has an identity crisis. Take a good long look at a crucifix. There you will see Jesus Christ, true God and true man. If you want to know who God is, look at a crucifix. And there you will see the Father's only Son. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. 
You'll find out about God when you look at the crucifix, about his love, his sacrificial love. You say, well, I want to know about humanity. I want to know about my own nature. Look at a crucifix, for Jesus is not only true God, he is true man. Why did God put you and I on the earth? You know why? To become other Christs. Now, there is only one Christ. There is only one Jesus. There is only one Savior. There is only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. But Jesus wills to incorporate us into the great work of redemption. And so we are taken up in Christ. That's the meaning of baptism. The old man dies, the new is reborn. We're taken up in Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. I live, I move, I have my being in him. That's my identity. Well, if you ever forget who you are, look at a crucifix, and that'll remind you of the meaning of life. Why a cross? God could have done it any way he pleased. Now, Almighty God could have snapped his divine fingers, and that would have been more than sufficient to redeem an infinity of worlds. For after all, he is God. He's all-powerful. Snap his fingers, redemption is finished. We're all home free. He didn't choose to do it that way. He did it the way he did it. He chose to do it on a cross to show the height and depth and breadth of his sacrificial love. Talk is cheap. You say, I love you. That's a nice sentiment. Maybe it's true. I say to you, you wonderful people, you good children of God, I love you dearly. And you say, yeah, talk is cheap, Father. What is authentic love? Authentic love is tested love. As a sign of love, man and woman get married. When they're, when they're young, everything's beautiful. You know, you're, you just, you can't wait to see each other. There's chemistry at work. You know, every once in a while, they, some distressed pastor when I'm visiting will say, would you talk to a young couple about to get married? They're coming over tonight for the pre cana counseling. Would you talk to them? I don't think they have a clue about marriage or love. And so, the, brush, the blushing bride-to-be and the groom show up at the rectory. And instead of the benign, smiling face of the pastor, <laughs> they find me. <laughs> and I will say to them, so you're going to be married. That's great. Wonderful, you must be in love. Oh, okay. well, yeah, Father. We're in love, you know, that's why we're getting married. Great. Tell me, what is love? Well, you know, Father. Love, we got feelings for each other. Hey, man, feelings are up and feelings are down and feelings are all around. It's like a yo-yo. The devil's pulling the string. If all you've got is feelings, you're in trouble. What else? And the blushing bride-to-be might say, Ooh, we've got chemistry. <laughs> Honey, that can blow up. <laughs> Come on, what else is love? They never get it. So how about this? If you love someone, you desire the highest and best thing for the sake of that person. And nobody can disagree with that. If you love someone, you want the highest and best thing for the one you love. Well, yeah, okay, yes. Okie dokie. What's that? Well, you know, uh, we want to have a, a good job. Okay. A nice house. Great. 
some children, better yet, a doggy named Spot, <laughs> early retirement, okay, good, not bad things, all right, what else, what else, well, come on, Father, what else could that be, and then you just give him the punchline, how about heaven, if you love someone, and love is desiring the highest and best thing for the sake of the one you love, do you desire eternal salvation for that person you love? And are you willing, are you willing to do anything and everything to get them there? Talk is mighty cheap. And we say, I love you, I love you. The pastor loves his flock, and the bride loves the groom, and everybody loves everybody. And then we get down to the battle. And we find out who loves who. When the cross looms in the immediate future. And husbands desert their wives, and wives desert their husbands, and pastors desert their flocks, and religious desert their congregations and their vocations. Why? Very often, because pain and suffering confront them. It isn't easy to be a husband or wife today, is it? It isn't easy to be a parent today. It isn't easy to be a young person today. Hard, hard, cruel world. It isn't easy to be a priest today either. Brutal. None of it's easy. Not easy for you, not easy for me. But what are we going to do? Cut and run? I remember when I used to box. I was a pretty good boxer, and I rarely lost. But I remember a couple of fights that were tough. I remember one in particular, going all the way to the finals of the Golden Gloves in the Eastern region, all the tough guys from New York and New Jersey, the whole Eastern seaboard. And I got right to the finals as a middleweight, the equivalent of what we'd call a middleweight. And, and I ran into a real tough guy. The first round, I knew I was in trouble. I knew this guy was better than me. He was stronger than me, and he was quicker than me. And I after about another round of it, thoughts began to go through my mind, I better lay down. <laughs> I could get hurt. <laughs> but to be honest with you, those thoughts didn't stay very long. I had the idea, he's going to have to kill me. He's going to have to kill me. He may beat me. Fair and square, he'll deserve to win, but I ain't going to lay down in this fight or any other one. He will have to kill me flat out dead. Now, what about you? In this immortal combat, what about you in this war to end all wars? What about you fighting for the salvation of your own soul, not to mention souls of your children, your grandchildren, all your friends and relatives. You're going to throw the fight? You're taking a beating. I sympathize with you. It'd be easy to lay down. Who could blame you? You're bloody. You're bruised. You're battered. Why, it's already the 15th round. Who could blame you? Don't lay down. Don't throw the fight. Don't give up. God is with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? You and I are absolutely, essentially, irrevocably important in this battle. You have been given souls that you are accountable for. I have been given souls that I will be held accountable for. I am in the arena. I am slugging it out with a superior force. It's a mismatch. 
but, but, God Almighty is in my corner. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am weak, but it is in weak, when I am weak that I am made strong. St. Paul said it is in weakness that God's mighty power is brought to perfection. It is when I am weak, and precisely when I am weak, that I am strong. Now this is a major principle in the spiritual life. Today we have another horrendous sin. We have abortion, but at the other end of the spectrum we have euthanasia. In a senseless culture that doesn't understand the value, the salvific value, of redemptive suffering would have us put our elderly out of their misery like old dogs. Well, I'm telling you that our elderly have been placed at the focal point of power. They have been set at the pinnacle of power, for they are set on the cross of Christ. And that is indeed the pinnacle of power, for it is where you have the greatest possibilities why? No greater love hath a man or woman, but that they lay down their life for their friends and their enemy. The greatest power, the force, is redemptive suffering. I spent three years of my life, day and night, praying and studying this subject. It was my doctoral thesis, my licentiate thesis as well, tending to answer the why. Why does a good God permit evil? In order to bring a greater good out of it. Look at a crucifix if you don't believe me. It is at once the worst and the greatest thing ever. The worst because it is deicide. God experienced death through his human nature, part of the doctrine of the faith. Look it up. Jesus is God. He experienced death through his human nature. Creatures lift up the creator on the cross. And yet it is the greatest thing in history. The good of the redemption. The captives are set free. It is that principle, the paradox of the cross, that it is written on every page of Christian history. There has never been a saint or good Christian who has not suffered. Every one of us, in some way, fills up in our own human life what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Colossians 1.24. St. Paul proclaimed that. It is now my joy. It is now my joy to suffer for you as I fill up in my own poor human flesh that which is yet to be consummated in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. I have never been a father in the natural order. I, I have no biological children. But in the last couple of years, God has given me a spiritual intimation of what it is like to love a child. Now many of you know what that is. Imagine God our Father. Now, we, in all of our imperfection, love our children very much. God, in his absolute, infinite perfection, loves his children, each one of them, in a way so profound that we can scarcely fathom it. Imagine if you had an only child, and that child was killed prematurely, my little sister when I came home from the Army, 1970, 71, 14 years old, just entered high school, went to a football game Friday night with some of her friends. 
My mother had had a premonition and warned her and ordered her not to go. The way that teenagers sometimes do, she snuck off, went anyway. On the way home from the game, the car crashed, hit a tree on a country road. Four of the five in the car were killed instantly, my sister among them, 14 years old. Why? Why does a good God allow so much pain? I was in college. I got a call. My sister said, you better come. Marianne's been in a car accident. Come quick as you can. I went straight to the hospital. Had that anxiety. You don't know. Oh, well, growing up, kids have a lot of bumps and bruises. She's probably OK. But then the nagging doubt. I walked in, and I saw my uncle, my mother's sister, brother. I walked in the lobby of the hospital. And I knew immediately she didn't make it. I went into a side room, and there was my mother. And on her face was etched the pain of a universe, pain of a parent who's lost her youngest child, the last one home. Now imagine the pain of God at the loss of any of his children. And you say, but God can't experience pain. God is God. He's impassable, incapable of pain. And I tell you, in some mystical way, God our Father, through his Son, through the power of the incarnation, the union of divinity and humanity, God somehow mystically experiences that pain of a parent grieving, worrying for the child. In the last couple of years, God's put it in my heart. I had such an anxiety for certain individuals that I scarcely had a night of sleep in two years because of it. A, a worry, a driving force, a compulsion almost to pray incessantly that not one of them be lost. There's a war for souls raging. And most of us don't have a clue or could care less that it's going on. I tell you, that if you want to please your Heavenly Father, contribute to the salvation of his beloved children. If you want to do something that will go down, not just in history, but for all eternity, as a great and noble thing, then unite yourself with Jesus Christ on his cross and allow him to use your physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering to bring down grace on his little ones. Many, many a night I wake up in the dark. In the faces of those I once knew in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, in high school, all over the world, those faces come to me. And I see them clear as the day that I was last with them. And I am moved to pray for them. I am moved to beg God to be merciful. I am moved to do penance for them. I am moved to ask Our Lady to help them. I place them in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, a safe haven, a mystical garden where God delights to dwell. I turn to the angels. I turn to the saints. I turn to the sacraments, I turn to the sacramentals, and there I wage war. There I wage war. There I encounter Satan and all his minions, their claws grasping for soul. And there God Almighty and Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, says, this far you'll come and no far farther shall you come enemy, 
adversary. We are at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the hosts of wickedness, the rulers of this age of darkness, the fallen angels, the devil. We are at war. And it behooves you and I to take up the weapons, spiritual weapons, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Take all the weapons and don't quit. Don't quit until God uses up the last breath in you. And with your last breath, Praise Jesus and his holy mother, and with your last breath, offer it, offer it all for the salvation of souls, the glory of our Father's kingdom. And if you do that, I promise you before God Almighty, when it's over, when you run the race to the finish line, when you've fought the good fight, oh, you'll stand before God, all right, but not in fear, triumphant. And he'll smile at you as a father welcoming his beloved child. And you'll hear those beautiful words. Well done, my soldier, my warrior, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.